Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. We're big, we're bad, and yes, I am in black. We're back with another Frequently Asked Questions, Fact Friday. So this has been a rather wonderful week. Monday's video was all about intention, and I'm sure it's gonna come up in this video. Got to talk about Motorhead, Ace of Spades, the police message in a bottle, which is a personal favorite of mine. Huge, huge song. We also got Mark Daniel Nelson to do a rather wonderful episode on reverbs. If you haven't seen that yesterday, and today we're going to talk about a couple of fun things. If you haven't already, please subscribe. You can hit that notification bell and you'll be notified. Also hit the like button if you like the video and don't forget to go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. Okay, without much further ado, Eric picked out the questions here. And I think this is a fun one to start a whole massive discussion going. Let's be honest, this one's going to, to light up the airwaves. And here's the question. How do you avoid using too many tracks in a song? Led Zeppelin and Yes all recorded on eight tracks. Yes, those bands did record some of their records on eight tracks. But uh, both of them had careers, obviously, through the 70s and, in Yes's uh, cases, 80s. And by um, early 70s, actually, all those bands were recording on at least 16 track. In fact, 16 tracks came in early, early 70s. And uh, 24 tracks for both bands, for definitely for Zeppelin for the last couple of albums. And then, of course, Yes for well beyond that. But I understand your point. Your point is, do you need the amount of tracks? Well. Here's the interesting thing. Let's move from Zeppelin and Yes for a second and move to one of my favorite bands, actually my favorite band. And for those of you that know where I'm going, of course, I'm talking about Queen. Queen's masterpiece, of course, is A Night at the Opera. And the masterpiece of all masterpieces, of course, is Bohemian Rhapsody. Bohemian Rhapsody was very famously recorded on two inch tape, I believe it is rumored to have been on a 16 track. If you listen to it or you listen to anything of that period, and if you do have access and you, there may be some multi tracks flying out there. Anyway, if you listen to that on one track, for instance, there are multiple, multiple layers of vocals. The same could be said even going back to yes, there are tracks with multiple overdubs on them. So, why am I pointing out this very, very obvious fact? It's not so much the amount of tracks, because if you were to break down, for instance, Bohemian Rhapsody, you might end up with four part harmonies each side layered four times. So 16 and 16 dumped down to maybe a pair of faders. So what they were doing is they were bouncing tracks, they were recording four people around a microphone, another four people, and then bouncing those down, and bouncing them down, bouncing them down. So the track count is a little bit confusing because ultimately they had a ton of overdubs on there. Ton, absolutely crazy. All the harmony guitar parts, everything. The difference is, is they were making sub mixes of those parts. One of the things to think about in your DAW and it will help you and make you think clearer and come up with the yes kind of philosophy and, and the queen philosophy and all of those kind of bands is to think about committing. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean about bouncing, you know, your 16 part harmonies that you've recorded each side. You can, if you want, bounce those down to one track on the left and one track on the right and have a stereo five harmonies. But the reality is, is like you might want to re-blend them, but create the blend of the harmonies and group them. Create the blend of the harmonies on the other side and then group them to a stereo file. Now, with Pro Tools, and I'm sure many other DAWs, you can hide all of those tracks and just have them on a stereo fader. It's a wonderful thing. So now suddenly 32 tracks, which seems like a ton of backgrounds, is now on a stereo fader, just like Queen would have done on a stereo track. 32 tracks of harmonies on a stereo track. I think it's always a little confusing because the assumption when we talk about small track counts, like four track for the Beatles, 
eight track for Zeppelin, 16, 24 track, even 24 tracks seems like a small amount of tracks. Of course it is. But we weren't listening to 24 individual things. We were listening to tons of things that were summed together. Now, of course, I hear you. Yes, I know DOWs have gone crazy. You can have 192 plus tracks of things. The problem is not in the track count. I get your question, but it's not in the track count. It's in the execution. It's in the philosophy behind it. It's the non-committal that is the problem. You can have, as I just illustrated, 32 tracks of vocals, some to stereo fader, just like 32 tracks of vocals on a Queen song on a stereo track. I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm trying to create a very strong visual for you. That the difference is the committing, is the making a decision, making the vocal blend, and then summing it down. That is the difference. It's not the track count. Because you could do that 12 times over and get 12 stereo faders. Each one of those tracks has 16 tracks bounced to it. So do the math. It's hundreds and hundreds of tracks. So you can have hundreds of tracks on a 24 track because they're all bounced together. In the late 70s and early 80s, you could have a Simti track triggering tons and tons of different like sequencing stuff, and, and, and many people did. And that could all be bounced or just triggered through the console. And you could have tons and tons of stuff playing at once. There was always great recordings, things that we love, that had a lot of parts to it, a lot of tracks. So let's not get too caught up in the idea that 4, 8, 16, or 24 is a bunch of geniuses. What was really was about was about the commitment. Because even if you listen to Sgt. Pepper, that's two four tracks synced together. Bounce, 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 bounce. They were bouncing like crazy, creating multiple tracks, but they didn't have any individual control after they had bounced them. So what was it all about? Again, it's all about commitment. Monday, the beginning of the week, we talked about intention, this idea of optionitis. And I said, I really firmly believe that optionitis is not a thing. Because if you have an intention about what you want, you look for the tools to fulfill that. You know what you want. If you want something to sound old school and classic or whatever, you go for those kind of tools to create that sound. You don't go, I've got 200 EQs. You go, I've got 200 EQs, but only three of them that emulate the sound I'm looking for. So I'll look at those three. If you're trying to create something really specific, just hone in on that. So with the idea of multiple tracks, just make sure you're committing to an idea. The problem comes is when you send somebody 200 tracks to mix, and there's no intention. There is like tons and tons of background vocals, but they're not grouped together. They're not blended into the sound you want. They're just, everything's at zero, and it's like, you figure it out. That is not bad engineering. That is bad production. Intention and commitment allows you to build a song. As I said in the intention video at the beginning of the week on Monday, mixers miss those days. Why do they miss those days? Because the work was done for them. Because they would bring it up on fader and they would do oh, just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a bit more extra verb. Now they're complaining about, oh my God, I get all these tracks and I have to figure it all out. It's like, yeah, because records, there are so many of the records we grew up listening to. You pull them up on fader and balance them a little bit. They sound so close to the final product. The mixer's job was just to kind of add that sprinkle of fairy dust. Nowadays, it's all super hard work of trying to figure out people's intention with their commitment. So let's not get hung up on the amount of tracks because there's so many ways to commit to things by grouping them, bouncing them to stereo faders in just the same way that was done on a four track, an eight track, a 16 or 24. So I get it, but let's remember the eight tracks could have been filled with a ton of overdubs bounced together. So that's the clear message for me. Have intention and commit to ideas and your production will get better and your mixing will be a heck of a lot easier. And all of those mixers you send tracks to will be much happier because their life will be easier. So here's a good question. We did a video a couple of weeks ago, which is not like a hugely successful video because it was an interesting 
topic. We talked about the difference between producer contracts and production contracts. There had been a, bit, a little bit of a buzz, and people were asking me, what is a production contract? And I talked about it from the perspective of the artist as well as the producer, meaning a production contract is great protection for a producer, but it's also hindered many, many insert many, 10 times, artists from being successful. They've been tied to a producer for a period of time, and that has held them back from getting a proper record made. And that's one perspective. And then, of course, a production contract is also good for the producer. If the artist does go off and be successful without them, the time they've put into them can be repaid effectively. The worst thing about production contracts, as I'm sure you know, is Guys and girls that produced artists but never actually did any work. And then the artists that get signed by a label and they're attached to them. There's producers attached to the artist and it hinders their progression. So for me, it's really, really important that contracts are fair for everybody. And you will not build a career as a producer for yourself if you're unfair to the artist. Word gets around and people will not want to work with you. And you will not continue to produce, and you'll have to figure out some other career path to make money. So don't do that. You know, get yourself into a position where you're protected, but then you're able to help the artist and do what's best for the artist. If it means stepping down and getting out of the way, then do that. You know, as Dave Jordan said, your job sometimes is to get in there and redo everything. And other times it's just to get out of the way and help the artist make a great record. So this question is a little bit to do with that. If you have started working on a project without an official signed contract in place, is it deemed that you have agreed to a contract based on the fact that you have commenced working on that music? That's really, really interesting. No, not really. If you've had discussion by email, you can define it. My lawyer always says if it's in an email, it's as good as a contract. The thing is, if you defined what you're going to do for the artist, how many hours, months, weeks, days, commitment you're going to do at a certain price, if you define that, even if it's not in a signed contract, it is something you can go back to. If you've ever watched any of those, I know it's funny, but if you ever watched any of those kind of Judge Judy things, the law is the law. And if you turn up to a court and go, here's an email, and the email says, I'm going to do three weeks worth of work at X number of dollars. In the email, we agreed before starting. We didn't have a contract, but you agreed and confirmed you owe me the money. And the artist says the same thing. You said you're going to do three weeks of work worth of work, but you only did a week and then walked away. I don't owe you the money for three weeks. It's going to stand up in a court of law. There's no two ways about it. Contracts are there for subtleties, for lots and lots of detail stuff, and they're definitely worth doing in situations where there's a reasonable amount of money at stake. Obviously, if you're doing a $50 job, don't spend $1,500 on the contract. But if you're doing a huge record or you're committing yourself to work with an artist for a long period of time in development, get a contract because there's a lot of your time and energy being put into it and you should be paid back for your services. So contracts are important, but just starting working with an artist is not agreeing to anything. It's just you're working with an artist. If you have nothing agreed upon, nothing whatsoever, not an invoice sent, not a contract, not an email stipulating what you're doing, you can be in trouble. Now, you can send them an invoice in an email and say how long you're going to work with them for what period of time and what the stipulation is for them to agreeing to hire you. And you can ask for a confirmation. You could do that. You just need something in writing saying what you're doing, and you need them to confirm it. You can't just send an email saying, you owe me a million dollars, I made a record for you. is isn't going to happen. You need them to interact with you. I always suggest, whenever I've talked to an artist on the phone, just immediately respond with an email. Hey, John, Jack, Josie, whoever it is, great talking to you. Just want to confirm the details we discussed on the phone. Uh, you know, you're going to pay me this amount of dollars for this amount of work. It's going to take this long. Here's the amount of, you know, mixes I'm going to do or songs I'm going to finish. Here's my price for after three recalls. I'll do three recalls in your price. After that, it's going to be $100 a recall or $50, whatever it might be. 
all of this in there. Please respond and confirm these details. Yours sincerely, Fred Smith. Just send the email. If you don't respond in two days, hey, just following up. Just want to make sure that you got my email just to confirm before we get started the amount of work, the payment terms, etc. Just to confirm. If I don't respond, you, you have to think very seriously about doing that job. You need to get them to confirm those payment terms, how it's going to be done. If they have any issue, sure, figure it out. But make sure you get it confirmed. Without it being confirmed, it's just like sending off an email to anybody. Pick that person down the street, get their email address, send them an email, say they owe you $10,000, start making an album. You know, it might as well be that. You need to get them to confirm. You need something in writing from them confirming the payment terms, etc. everything that you are doing. Now, contracts are really important. If you've got a budget, get them done, hire a great lawyer. But these days, so much of our work is in the hundreds of dollars, not the thousands of dollars. And it's very, very difficult to always have expensive, incredible contracts in place. So make sure you at least protect yourself by getting stuff confirmed in email. So thanks ever so much for watching. That was a lot of fun. Two completely different things there. Let's have a conversation about the four track, eight track, 16 track, 24 track idea of how everybody used to be a genius and now they're not. But we know that's not true. It was a great, great time. I loved making records on tape. I loved the idea of the restrictions of the amount of tracks we had. It made me focus and commit to things. But that's the thing, intention and commitment, intention and commitment. I'll keep mentioning it till I'm blue in the face. And of course, the contract thing, I totally get it. If you have the budget, get a lawyer in place. But if not, make sure you have everything in email and confirmed by the artist before you get started. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. See you all again very soon. So long, farewell, Avida Zayn, au revoir, adios, goodbye.